Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I hope this finds you feeling empowered and ready to take further control of your health. I'm Dr. Chad McIntyre of the Triad Upper Cervical Clinic in Kernersville, North Carolina. And from wherever you may be listening, I thank you for making this health awareness theme program a part of your life. Today, the topic is the best kept secret in healthcare, which I'll reveal after I do some stage setting to establish some, what I would consider to be important context. At the moment it is revealed, it will probably strike you as a no-brainer. But believe me when I tell you that from personal experience, having learned this information 13 years ago myself and having taught it over the past decade plus in private practice to thousands of people, that aha moment will likely be immediately followed by a lot of questions, maybe some doubts, because logical as this best-kept secret may be, as much sense as I think it will make by the time we get to that point, we just haven't really been taught to think about health in the simple ways that we're going to cover today. Some might say that, and it has been said before numerous times, that what I'm about to teach is so simple that it's hard to get. Some of you will probably get beyond those questions and doubt. It's quickly, some of you may struggle a bit more. It's okay. The process of digesting this information, everyone has their own individual journey with it. So, to start establishing that context, when you consider the limited education we receive about health, uh, how largely it's built around responding to symptoms, obvious signs of discord, which are often big examples of how unhealthy we've already become. What I'm going to be teaching is from the standpoint of a more proactive type headspace, but we often don't get to work with people in my practice that are of the proactive mindset. We're often having to teach people who are still in that reactive kind of a mode because that's the way healthcare is built. We've all been taught that health is like calculus is to mathematics that it's complicated and that it's overly complex and that there's very little way that the average person would be able to understand it. It's, it's actually reached a critical point in our, in our healthcare history when people are, are really surprised to learn that the body can heal itself, that it doesn't need chemical interventions to heal, or that ensuring that the immune system is firing on all cylinders is the most important thing for combating a virus. Sure, the inner workings of the human body are incredibly complex and don't want to, to undersell that, but the role that we individually play in helping our bodies execute at peak efficiency, that's not that complicated. That's the equivalent of adding, subtracting, multiplying and dividing in math the foundational pieces that make an understanding of something like calculus possible. Health, by the American system's definition, is a state of being free of injury or illness or symptoms. The healthcare industry, as we know it, has been built around that definition. The key to a revitalized healthcare system is going to be to focus it on health instead of the symptoms of illness, and that's really Focusing on health and how to achieve it is where the best-kept secret comes into play. If we redefined health instead as an optimized state in which the numerous organ systems in the body work harmoniously together at a level conducive to sustaining an innate adaptability capable of preventing sickness and overcoming the various causes of symptoms, the question then logically becomes, how do you achieve that state? What are the pillars of basic health that are the equivalents of adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing in math? I'm hoping that what you take away from today will help further create a new baseline understanding of health and how each of us can achieve it, giving power and responsibility back to each of us individually because in large part, the health system that we've all grown up in has stripped a lot of that power and responsibility away from us. To that end, it's important to emphasize a forest instead of individual trees mentality as it relates to your body. 
recognizing that you're a product of intricate internal relationships, neurologically, meaning your internal communication network, psychologically, meaning your thoughts, physiologically, meaning how things work inside, and anatomically, so your structure. It's not just a bunch of random parts to be studied and treated in sections, but one functioning unit, like an assembly line. So let's start to work our way toward the best kept secret. There are five broad based categories that shape how healthy you are that really are the equivalents of those four foundational pieces of, of mathematics. The most underrated one is stress management. Stress causes internal chaos, triggering a fight or flight response that your body may struggle to get out of. That's really, that's a big topic for another day, but it cannot be understated. The two categories that everybody knows about are nutrition and exercise. Exercise is essential because your body is made to move. It's made of muscle internally and externally that needs to move. And to be sedentary basically just goes against the nature of the body. Nutrition is loosely defined as the things that you need to put into your body that your body cannot replenish on its own. Without question, we certainly need to do a better job of educating people about the vital importance of proper nutrition. Because right now, most people use eating to treat symptoms, like eating if, if they need to make improvements nutritionally, they're doing it to treat symptoms like weight gain or stomach aches or some other diagnosed digestive disorder, rather than eating well because they understand that their bodies use food to make new cells. Every six to eight minutes, you have new stomach lining cells. Every four to six weeks, you have new liver cells. Every four months, you have all new blood cells. So your body is constantly eliminating old cells among your on average 75 trillion and making new ones through the food that you eat. So asking yourself a question like, would you rather build new cells out of vegetables untainted by bug spray and weed killer or processed chicken nuggets from the local fast food joint? That's an important question that I, I, I hope that will eventually be taught to ask. Right now though, 7% of people eat well because they know they should. 100% of people know that they should. 20% of people eat well because they're reacting to the consequences of not eating well. And the other 70-ish percent are largely oblivious because while they were told at some point eat well, they were never really taught why. As to the other two of the five aforementioned categories, which are tied into the best kept secret, I ask you first to consider... How long can you live without managing stress? And how long can you live without exercise? I think you know we can, live, we can live a long time without exercise. Plenty of people live a long time being sedentary and being really stressed out. Exercise and, and, and stress management, they... They aren't necessary to be alive, but they are vital to be healthy. You can be 2% alive on a 100% scale. That doesn't mean that you're healthy. You look at someone like Christopher Reeve after he fell off that horse and broke his neck. He was alive, probably around 20% or less alive. He was, I mean, he was as healthy as he could be, arguably, but I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think you could make a credible argument that he was healthy. Survival may be our current disease-based system's aim, but health is not about survival. It's about thriving. So another consideration. How long can you live without food? The answer is about 30 days. How long can you live without water? About three days. How long can you live without air? Interesting Interestingly, oxygen is an essential nutrient that we, we get by breathing, which we only do, on average, at about a third of our full capability. Again, because nobody really taught us otherwise. But we can live without it for about three minutes. So, now I want you to ask yourself about how long can you live 
without the electrical impulses that course through your nerves, that flow from the brain down to the brain stem, further down along the spinal cord, out along the nerves that supply every organ, muscle, tissue, and cell in your body. 0, 0.0 seconds. You cannot live at all once you stop the flow of electrical impulses. Life, you see, begins with that divine spark when sperm meets the egg. And the first thing that forms is actually your brainstem, which from that point on acts like a switchboard operator governing your internal function. Like a conductor in a symphony orchestra, your brainstem coordinates the activities of the brain and the body. 75 trillion cells perform 200,000 chemical reactions in your body every split second. And the brainstem runs the show. It's the most important part of the body, and it needs to be able to do its job properly in order for the rest of the parts to do theirs properly. Many mistakenly believe that the brain is the hub of the nerve system, but babies are actually born every year without one and remain alive, often for years. The brain stem is actually the nerve system's hub, making it the one part of the body you can't live without. You look at death by hanging. That severs the nerve system's hub, the brain stem, like shutting off the main fuse in a house. Near instantly, life ends. The flow of electrical impulses through the brain stem, though, is not an all-or-nothing proposition. You look at someone like Christopher Reeve. He was paralyzed post-horse accident, not because he broke the top bone in his neck, but because of the force that broke his neck also severely damaged his brain stem, which is like the cell tower of the human body network, routing the electrical impulses between the brain and the various parts of the body. It directly does the brainstem control digestion, heart function, and lung function. And then indirectly, it's involved with everything else. So with Christopher Reeve, his major system shut down because his brainstem was so damaged. There was an umpire years ago as well that got struck by a line drive right behind the ear. Your brainstem sits right in a space between your ears. So it so violently shoved into the brainstem when that ball hit right behind the ear that it actually caused the umpire to die instantly. NFL players have repeated head traumas. They live about 20 years less than the rest of us on average, uh, not just because their brains are damaged, but because their brain stems are injured. Bearing in mind that concussive forces to the brain require about 95 Gs of force. While injuries to the upper neck where the brainstem anatomically resides requires just four Gs of force. There's a story about Jim McMahon of the Chicago Bears Super Bowl team on an ESPN 30 for 30 documentary that starts to shift the focus from head injuries to the brainstem and spine that will illustrate these points. The bottom line being, if the quarterback of the body's functions is playing at 60% or less, it's hard to expect victory if the winning objective is health. The brainstem's job is to make sure everything works normally. But when it becomes compromised, then any part or parts of the body can begin to function abnormally. Think of function like the school grading scale. If your nerve system functions at 90% or better, if the brainstem can communicate with all parts of the body that well, then you earn an A. If your brainstem is compromised, if you don't keep the primary line of communication open between your brain and your body, then life suffers. You would not obviously desire to make D's or F's and be like 70% to 60% or worse on your neurological report card, but most of us do because none of us have been taught about the importance of the brainstem. In my clinic, I am usually the first person who has ever brought up the brainstem with the people I work with in a clinical setting, which, considering some of them have got significant neurological disorders, is shocking. But since we're not taught about the brainstem and how it can be adversely affected by traumas 
influence on the anatomy that surrounds and protects it. And when I say nobody, that includes most doctors, even those who specialize in neurology, because they weren't trained to look at it that way. They were trained to look at pathology, at the effects of an underlying cause. They are disaster intervention specialists, more or less, like the fire department of medicine. But an electrical wiring issue that hasn't caused a fire is not the field of the fire department, and neither is the function of the brainstem the medical doctors concern. They do different things. Most health conditions develop over time because proper habits to avoid them aren't taught until they develop. Migraines, digestive problems, autoimmune conditions, carpal tunnel syndrome, ear infections, headaches, low energy, lack of concentration, diabetes, hypertension, sinus drainage issues, etc., 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 all develop in part because the neurological hub that controls the organs associated with these problems cannot do their job properly. The biggest issue with the brainstem is its surrounding anatomy. It's unique. There's an opening at the floor of the skull for the brainstem to exit and drop down into the rings within the first two topmost vertebrae in the spine. These openings are each roughly the size of the opening in a water bottle, whereas the brainstem, which is a bundle of billions of nerves, nerve fibers tightly coiled into a little space, is about the size of your thumb. The top bone of the neck is the most unique of all. It's held in place only by muscle and features no interlocking joints or bony locks. It makes it more vulnerable to the effects of head trauma, which we all suffer numerous variations of early in our lives especially. For instance, if a child bangs his or her hand on the wall, it hurts, but very rarely would the joints that connect the bones even slightly dislocate because they're locked in place. If the same child bangs his or her head on the wall, there's often not enough development in the supporting musculature to avoid a subtle shift of the upper cervical spinal vertebrae under the skull's base. Take two water bottles and match them up perfectly. Despite being full, no leak would be expected. Take one and move it under the other by one to three millimeters and you're going to make a mess from the spill. Structurally, the same dynamic exists in the area that protects the brainstem. If the skull and upper cervical vertebrae don't match up perfectly, the brainstem becomes compromised. And the greater the shift, then the greater the compromise. And the greater the compromise, then the more the significant effects you'll see with the rest of the body. Remember, the brainstem is part of everything that happens with the rest of the body. So if it isn't functioning normally, then any part or parts of the body might begin to function abnormally causing them to break down and to become unhealthy and to show various signs and symptoms thereof. If you put a dimmer switch on the main fuse of your house and then turn the power down, it turns the power down everywhere. Adding another layer of insult to this injury is that the brainstem is located within the body's structural foundation. Indeed, the body is built not from the ground up, but from the top down. Your skull and the top bone in your neck are the first bones to form during the developmental process in the womb. And every other bone is built below them. So just like any other structure, where the foundation of the body goes, the rest of the body goes. Equilibrium, depending as it does on the eyes being level and the head being level and the brain being level, a function of the head being perfectly balanced on top of the neck, The muscles throughout the body constantly compensate, returning the head to being relatively level following a trauma that causes head and neck misalignment, what those in the upper cervical chiropractic field refer to frequently as a brainstem subluxation. The misalignment is effectively a three combination locking mechanism that happens for an initially positive reason to get the head level. But it also creates a cascade of longer-term effects in its wake, presuming that it doesn't get unlocked for years to decades, which is typically the problem. The head and neck being locked in the wrong position as a result of the body's attempt to keep the head relatively level for the purpose of balance and equilibrium 
is no different than the foundation of your home shifting, really. A body that's lacking in structural balance is a body under constant strain and loses its structural integrity over time as a result. If the head is not level due to a foundational imbalance, the body's just naturally going to adjust. For example, a shoulder, a shoulder will raise up, a hip will drop, and a leg will appear to be shorter than the other. If left unchecked and uncorrected, the other parts of the body will also work to compensate for that basic structural imbalance, forcing the body into a constant state of repair instead of performing routine daily maintenance. This ultimately results in structural breakdown and coinciding symptoms that include pain, numbness, tingling, headaches, fibromyalgia, sciatica, chronic pain from the neck to the shoulders to the low back to the hips, etc. I mean, all of these things are commonly caused by this foundational shift, this locking mechanism of your body's foundation. And unfortunately, this is a very common issue that can happen as early as through the birthing process. Abraham Talbin was a medical doctor with Harvard's medical school back in the day. He once confirmed the obvious fact that, quote, life for the newborn depends upon the preservation and healthy functioning of the brainstem and spinal cord at the level of the upper neck, end quote. It's an area adversely affected by the sort of pulling that nearly all infants experience during the birthing process, either by the doctor's hands, normal or C-section, forceps or suction. There was a German medical physician and researcher named Gottfried Gutmann. He found that up to 80% of newborns suffered subtle upper cervical spinal injuries during delivery, and that despite the prevalence, typical exams almost never identify them. By a 500 to 1 ratio compared to the rest of our lives combined, physical traumas in general occur most often from birth to roughly age 10. And as parents, we're taught only to be concerned with the pronounced and immediate effects, but the subtle long-term aftermath associated, for instance, with the loss of head and neck alignment, which, to recap, basically wraps a bony band around part of the brainstem, restricts blood flow to the brain, and causes the entire physical frame to adapt in compensation. It's just as significant. It's just delayed a few years to even decades in the effects that it shows. It certainly does not require a concussion-inducing head trauma to cause an upper cervical spinal misalignment. Physiology, how things function, is dependent on the correct position of the anatomy. It is basic applied science to recognize that the incorrect position of the anatomy negatively changes the physiology and then Further recognize that developing a system of identification and correction like that used by upper cervical chiropractors is the solution to fixing that problem. Structural imbalance can be identified very quickly. The brainstem being compromised is easily identifiable through a technology called thermography. And the details necessary to determine how to correct these findings can be discovered by a specific x-rays or 3D CT scans. So... Ladies and gentlemen, the best kept secret in healthcare is the importance of the brainstem and its surrounding structural anatomy. If your head is literally not on straight, if your brainstem is compromised, and your body has structurally compensated from head to toe, abnormal function will lead to the development of various abnormal conditions through the weakening of your body's innate ability to adapt to various stressors, viruses included, and structural imbalance will lead to structural breakdown in its associated signs and symptoms, which also weaken your resilience and make you more susceptible to disease. It really is. It's just simple cause and effect. So I thank you for taking the time today. My closing message to you is a reminder that we all can really make a difference in healthcare by just becoming better informed. We can change the healthcare industry by demanding it be better and knowing what better can be by learning these well-kept secrets and acting on them. So I encourage you to research upper cervical chiropractic. Visit tryoutuppercervical.com. Learn, become better informed. It's time, in my opinion, that these best-kept secrets were not secrets. We all need to know these things. It's basic anatomy and physiology 101 applied. 
Honestly, the future of healthcare may well rest in this philosophical and scientific shift. You know, healthcare in America is really not going to change until its focus does. So share, please, share these various things you've learned through all these different presentations throughout this event. You never really know how something you think, say, or do today could affect the lives of millions tomorrow. So let's, let's be revolutionaries. Be well, my friends, and please get your heads on straight. Your health potential in part depends on it. Thanks.